This is our teach in, act up, organizing, educating, protesting the Trump agenda. So please join us. I'm Nandita Sharma. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Sociology here at Manoa. And we had a teach-in about three weeks ago, one week after the Trump election. And at that teach-in, at the past teach-in, there was a lot of outpouring of shock, um, disbelief, just like what has happened to us, what has happened, what's, go what's going to happen to us. And we wanted to organize this teach-in as a follow-up with more analysis, more insight into what is going on, what can we expect, where do we go from here together. So it's been one month today since Donald Trump was elected US president. And now that the shock is wearing off a little bit, I think the fear is setting in. And the fear is not an irrational fear. It's not a fear because whoever we may have voted for or not voted at all for anyone didn't win. The fear is setting in because of who Trump is appointing to run every major institution in this country. Trump has appointed his former campaign strategist, Steve Bannon, as his presidential advisor. This gives Bannon, an ex-Goldman Sachs banker and former head of the notorious Breitbart News, the greatest access to the president that any human being is going to have. He's going to be the closest physically to the president in the Oval Office. He's going to be the first and last person that Trump speaks to every day. Bannon has publicly advanced ideologies, including anti-Semitism, misogyny, racism, and Islamophobia. He stated this past July that the quote-unquote left were part of a quote, plot to take down America by fixating on police shootings of black people. Bannon added, what if the people getting shot by the cops did things to deserve it, he asked. There are, after all, in this world, he said, quote, some people who are naturally aggressive and violent. With his appointment to the president's advisor, Donald Trump is signaling to us a wholehearted embrace of such views. Ominously, Matthew Boyle, who is Breitbart's Washington political editor, has stated that if there's an, ex if there's an explosion or fire somewhere, Steve Bannon's probably somewhere nearby with matches. Trump's choice for Attorney General, the person who oversees elections, oversees voting rights, oversees our civil rights, is Jeff Sessions, a Republican senator from Alabama. Sessions has publicly suggested that civil rights advocacy groups are un-American and communist inspired. In a judicial hearing, Sessions called a white civil rights lawyer a quote, disgrace to his race for taking on voting rights suits. Sessions has also been a consistent defender of Trump's proposal to ban Muslims from entering the United States. And it continues, Trump has nominated billionaire Betsy DeVos as his education secretary to oversee public education. DeVos has been a major funder to try and further elevate for-profit schools with no consideration of the severe harm done to public schools in the process. An avowed supporter of charter schools, which not only further exacerbate funding problems for cash-strapped public districts, create an exodus of teaching from the profession, further blur the line between church and state, ch charter schools also do a great injustice to most of their students.
studies show, and we at universities are in the business of studying things, studies show that most students in charter schools, public, I mean, sorry, profit or non-profit across the United States do not prepare students as well academically as public schools do. Trump has appointed Michael Flynn, who has made incendiary and Islamophobic comments to oversee national security. This is a post so powerful that it vies with Secretary of State in influencing the President on foreign affairs and national security. Flynn has traded in conspiracy theory, like the one that he tweeted during the presidential campaign. Flynn tweeted that the New York police and prosecutors, he said, quote, found evidence linking Mrs. Clinton and much of her senior staff to pedophilia, money laundering, perjury, and other felonies, unquote. This is the man Trump has appointed to shape what the president reads, the theories he is influenced by. As the Washington Post has recently asked, what will he advise? Will it be some crackpot theory about this or that conspiracy? While railing against Wall Street and portraying himself as the champion of the working class, Trump has nominated Wilbur Ross to oversee commerce and Stephen Munchen to oversee the Treasury. Ross made his estimated $2.9 billion fortune by being a corporate fixer, buying companies, imposing significant layoffs, budget cuts, and ensuring in the result a windfall profit for the shareholders. When Ross purchased the Sago mine in West Virginia, an explosion there killed 12 miners. This is the man who will be in charge of government regulations to protect consumers from the rapacious actions of investors. Steve Munchen, formerly with Goldman Sachs, has also said that one of his priorities as Secretary of the Treasury would be to lift regulations. You know, the kinds of things that protect us from the Wall Street bankers. So we've organized an amazing list of people as resources to bring us together to organize, to educate, and to mobilize against this Trump agenda that's being slowly put into place. Some of the people that I've mentioned are appointees with no oversight. Others, uh, others of them are nominees that the Senate and the Congress have some say about um, being appointed. So this is the work that we have ahead of us to make sure that we oppose the nominations of the people that he's nominated for education, for housing and development, I forgot to mention, Ben Carson is uh, nominated for housing and development. So I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Peter Arnarde, the College of Arts and Humanities Dean, who's going to talk to us about freedom of speech and activism on university campuses. So please, Peter. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I was um, asked by Nandita if I could share some thoughts about freedom of speech. And so I will do so very briefly, because we have a big panel here today, and also it's an opportunity to have a discussion which is more, much more interesting than listening to me. It flies in the face of um, constitutional law and a body of rulings on this one matter, and of course violates the First Amendment. He also called for a strengthening of libel laws uh, to uh, curtail speech, uh, particularly around political criticism, and that's absolutely in violation of, again, a body of uh, legal rulings concerning libel in this country. So. He says some very um, worrisome things that I think we all should pay very close attention to. Now, the second thing I want to say is that universities have been centers of free speech activism. And if you don't know that history, I encourage you to learn that history. And we at the University of Hawaii, and I hear I speak as a dean, are absolutely committed to the right of public assembly and free speech on behalf of our students, staff, and administrators. We're proud to be part of a long tradition of universities 
and student activism that goes back, I guess, the signal um, event in recent history was the Berkeley Free Speech Movement of the fall of 1964. For those students who weren't born but then, and that's most of all of you, uh, for many of the faculty even, um, universities, and certainly University of California, prohibited political speech concerning non-university issues on campus. Um, and in 64, a group of students involved in civil rights uh, activism actively um, claimed uh, the right to speak politically on uh, first on the edge of university property, then within the boundaries of the university itself, uh, sparking an enormous and very, very famous um, uh, series of events that culminated in the resignation of both the university president, system president, Clark Kerr, but also the chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and um, the establishment of a free speech zone. Many of the leaders of the free speech movement are very, that movement are um, elders now, and Mario Savio uh, just died two years ago, and he was, he was a recognized leader, uh, the most famous leader of that movement, although it, it, it involved many, many more people. As, as you know, last year on college campus, there was a number of student and faculty activism around diversity and a whole range of, and a range of other political issues. And at the University of Missouri, uh, concerned over civil rights and racism issues, both the system president and the university chancellor resigned. So student activism has um, been a very, very distinguished history uh, in, in American higher education recently. And uh, I just want to reiterate again that we at the university affirm that tradition and affirm the right of free assembly and free speech. Thank you. There's another movement afoot for how universities can support us in these dangerous times, and that's the movement for a sanctuary campus. So the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, which is one of our most important institutions, has supported the movement for sanctuary campuses. They stated that, quote, administrators must make all efforts to guarantee the privacy of immigrant students and pledge not to grant access to information that might reveal their immigration status unless so ordered by a court of law. No, nor should colleges and universities gather information about the citizenship or immigration status of people who have interactions with the administration, including with campus police. College and university police should not themselves participate in any efforts to enforce immigration laws which are under federal jurisdiction. Faculty members should join efforts to resist all attempts to intimidate or inappropriately investigate undocumented students or to deny them their full rights to due process and a fair hearing. So let's make sure that this campus administration hears from us that we want UH to be a sanctuary campus. It's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Mateo Caballero, the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union here in Hawaii. And he's got these cards that you can pick up down here at the table about know your rights um, when you're interacting with the, with the state. So please uh, help me welcome Mateo Caballero. I'm Mateo Caballero, the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the Trump agenda and also about uh, my organization and what we do and what we're preparing to do uh, to respond to Trump's agenda. So uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, you know, we have been around for almost 100 years. Better? Sorry. Thank you. Not very sensitive, the mic. Okay. Um, we have been around for 100 years, and we have been protecting civil rights since, the, you know, since pretty much 19... Uh, 1920, I believe. So uh, the, the the big items in Trump's agenda that give us uh, concern, and by the way, even before uh, the election, the American Civil Liberties Union National Office had published something called the Trump Memos, which essentially go through all the different campaign promises that Trump has made, uh, you know, throughout the campaign and. 
uh, analyze them and say why they're unconstitutional and you know what legal precedent they violate and, and why we're concerned. Now, the American Civil Liber Liberties Union, the ACLU, is normally nonpartisan. We, we do not take, and we're still nonpartisan, I should say, uh, we normally do not support uh, candidates. We don't comment or you know, support, go, uh, urge people to support or go against cabinet appointments. Uh, however, we do you know, offer commentary about policies, and we do talk about uh, concerns we have uh, in terms of you know past histories. So, uh, with that in mind, let me go through at least five the, you know the five most worrying policy items uh, in Trump's agenda based on what he has said. So uh, the first one, and, and I think this is a big one, is of course immigration. Uh, he has uh, Trump has promised to ramp up immigration enforcement, and you know the numbers vary. At some point, he promised to deport all 11 million of un undocumented immigrants. Uh, but since then, you know, he has scaled back. He has talked about two to three million uh, of so-called criminals. Um, you know, there are no three to two to three million Im uh, criminal immigrants in the United States. The FBI thinks that uh, immigrants with a past criminal record are at most 800,000. Uh, that being said, it is very concerning that he talks in these terms, and you know we can expect that from day one, uh, certain programs, certain deferred action programs that President Obama has adopted, like DACA, you know, will come to an end. Um, now, what the ACLU is doing to prepare for uh, Trump's actions on immigration uh, is essentially to, well, one of the things is to let immigrants know about their rights. And for example, today uh, I'm flying to the island of Hawaii to give a presentation to uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants over there about you know, their rights and, and how to interact with ICE and the police. Uh, and that's why I urge any, everyone to take the Know Your Rights cards that I brought here today. Uh, the, the second thing, though, is that we can expect, uh, you know, how do you enforce immigration laws? Uh, you, we can expect that there's going to be racial profiling. We can expect that. Uh, once people are, are detained, they're not going to be provided their, their due process of, of law. Uh, and that's where the ACLU comes in, and, and we are prepared to, to make sure that both in terms of uh, arresting people and, detain, and detention, that the U.S. government follows the American Constitution. Now, the second policy item is uh, he has talked about banning entry to, to Muslims to the United States. He has talked about some sort of registry. Uh, and of course, you know, that, that brings back nightmares about what happened during the Second World War uh, here in Hawaii and, and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, we, again, are prepared to fight uh, President-elect Trump on, on those campaign promises. Uh, you know, we do not, we don't, we, in the United States, we do not uh, racially profiled, we do not have uh, religious tests. Uh, I, I, we believe that's an American. We believe, you know, that's a, completely against the Constitution, against the First Amendment, and and of course the ACLU is ready to fight for for everyone's right to 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 their religion. Um, the the third thing he has prom he has promised was uh, at some point he mentioned that he would punish women for exercising the right to choose. And you know the, the legal battle for access to abortion has been going on for a very long time, and we are not you know we have good partners with Planned Parenthood and other organizations, but the ACLU uh, is not a, is not going to back down. Again, we are ready to continue the fight and expand access uh, to abortion everywhere in the United States. Uh, the fourth thing is he has talked about kind of going back to the same policies concerning torture and waterboarding and perhaps even going farther than, than uh, President uh, Bush. And, uh, you know, the ACLU was very much involved during the, the Bush years, fighting President Bush on torture and waterboarding and trying to shine a light on, on some of these very dangerous, you know, completely unconstitutional and also illegal in terms of international law. 
Uh, and once again, you know, we, we, represent, we have represented uh, people in Guantanamo, we have represented people uh, that have been detained in the United States without uh, a fair hearing uh, for now, you know, 15 years. Uh, and that's not going to change. Uh, you know, as, as our executive director recently said, no matter who is the president, and, and this is why being nonpartisan matters. Uh, no, even under President Obama, we held him accountable. Under President Trump, that's, that's going to be the same. And the last one, and my last point, is concerning First Amendment. And you already heard a lot about it, so I'm, I'm going to be brief on this one. But uh, you know, Trump has very thin skin, or it looks like he has very thin skin. And every time there's criticism, every time uh, someone sheds, you know, shines the light on something he doesn't want people to talk about, uh, his MO is just to try to silence people. And one thing is to do that as a, as a private citizen. Another thing is to do that as the president-elect of the United States. Uh, and so, once again, uh, you know, the First Amendment is, is one of the core ACLU issues. What we, uh, from, you know, back in 1920 when we started, what we were trying to do is uh, protect the right of people to organize, uh, essentially unions to organize and, and fight for fair wages. And so the First Amendment is very deep and dear to, uh, to, to the ACLU. And again, uh, we are prepared to respond to whatever Trump has, you know, uh, in storage for us. Thank you. We need to watch out for these actions, and one of the people that's going to help us figure that out is Amber Makayao, who is with the Southern Poverty Law Center. So please help me welcome her. I'm going to build off of, I know everybody can hear me, I have a teacher voice, um, what the first two speakers have talked about in terms of First Amendment rights and the danger of what happens if places of education become places where people are afraid to talk. And that's a lot of what the Southern Poverty Law Center is finding what's happening in schools. So for people who aren't familiar with the Southern Poverty Law Center, it was founded by two Montgomery lawyers, Morris Dees and Joe Levin. And since its founding, it's shut down some of the nation's most violent white supremacist groups by winning crushing, crushing multi-million dollar jury verdicts on behalf of their victims. So it dismantled vestiges of Jim Crow, reformed juvenile justice practices, shattered barriers to equality for women, children, the LGBT community, and the disabled. It also protected low-wage immigrant workers from exploitation and more. In fact, it's really well known for dismantling the Ku Klux Klan. They took on the Klan as an organization instead of individual members and essentially helped to dismantle it. And then in the 1980s, there was a resurgence of the Klan, and so they started a, um, a monitoring center for white supremacy activity, and it's called Hate Watch. It's part of the Intelligence Project, and you'll notice in the news a lot that the Southern Poverty Law Center is brought in when hate crimes occur because they're the ones that are gathering information. And if you go to their website, they actually have a map that documents where hate groups are nationally. And then in the 1990s, Joe Levin and uh, Morris Dees were tired of defending and doing all of this work in courtrooms. And they said, if real change is gonna happen, this has to happen in schools. We need to create anti-bias, tolerance building, curriculum and materials so that students in schools are getting multiple perspectives to different things that they're hearing in their communities. And from there, teaching tolerance was born. Um, so those three arms of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a legal arm, the intelligence project, and then their education arm. So during the election, Teaching Tolerance decided to poll teachers to see about what has been happening in school and what they're doing about the election. They didn't mention any candidates on their survey that they sent out to schools. And what they found, there was 2,000 teachers that ended up taking the survey, and the results indicated that the campaign was having a profoundly negative impact on school children across the country producing an alarming level of fear and anxiety among children of color and inflaming racial and ethnic tensions in classrooms. Many students were worried about being deported. Many educators had fear about teaching the election at all. In fact, 40% of educators said they stopped teaching about the election in their classroom, which is alarming when you think about a social studies education. It's about preparing citizens for a deliberative democracy, and teachers are afraid to teach about the election. 
Um, from that, they produced something called the Trump Report, and it reported on how much teachers were writing about how Trump's rhetoric was affecting what was happening in their classrooms. Following the election, they decided to send out a survey again, and this was just done within the past two weeks, and the first survey had 2,000 teachers that responded. This one had 10,000 teachers, counselors, administrators, and others who work in schools responded. And the data indicate that the results of the election are having a profoundly negative impact on schools and students. And so I'm just gonna give you a brief summary of the report of what came out. Nine out of 10 educators who responded have seen a negative impact on students' mood and behavior following the election. Most of them worry about the continuing impact for the remainder of the school year. Eight in 10 reported heightened anxiety on the part of marginalized students, including immigrants, Muslims, African Americans, and LGBT students. Four in 10 have heard derogatory language directed at students of color, Muslims, immigrants, and people based on gender or sexual orientation. Half said that students were targeting each other based on which candidate they supported. Although two-thirds report that administrators have, res have been responsive, four out of 10 don't think that their schools have an action plan to respond to incidents of hate and bias on campus. Over 2,500 ed educators describe specific incidents of bigotry and harassment that can be directly traced to the election rhetoric. These incidents include graffiti, including swastikas, assaults on students and teachers, property damage, fights, and threats of violence. And because of the heightened emotion, half are hesitant to discuss the election in class, and some principals have told teachers to refrain from discussing or addressing the election in any way. That means 50% of these 10,000 teachers who responded are afraid to teach post-election in their classroom, which is really scary for a democracy. So at the end of the report, they also have some recommendations, and they're recommendations for schools, but I think they could also be looked at recommendations for communities in general. The first one is set the tone. We're aware that many superintendents and principals around the country have sent letters to staff and families, and you notice that happened here at the University of Hawaii. Um, if your administrator hasn't, they're saying that you should do this. Um, and they have examples on their website of things that communities can do to be letting people know that this is a safe place. And they're also recommending take care of the wounded. Many students, especially immigrant, LGBT, Muslim, and African American students are profoundly upset and worried about the election results. Their anxiety is warranted. Many have been targeted in and out of school by individuals who think Trump's election has licensed hatred and bigotry. They said, let your school community know that you have a plan and the necessary resources to support these students in the cases of trauma. The third one, double down on anti-bullying strategies. Encourage everyone in the school community to be aware of bullying, harassment, and bias in all of their forms. Remind them of the school's written policies and set the expectation that your staff be ready to act. Not everyone has to be a superhero, but everyone can be an ally and a fight, an upstander. Encourage courage. It's especially important to let staff and students know that you expect them to speak up when they see or hear something that denigrates any member of the school community. When students interrupt biased language, calmly ask questions, correct misinformation, and echo others who do the same. They send their peers a clear message that this kind of language does not fly here. And finally, they're recommending to schools to be ready for a crisis. The news and social media are awash in posts about ugly bias incidents and even hate crimes. In our communities and schools, when an incident happens, you will not have time to learn how to manage that. And they suggest to schools for developing a plan and they have a number of resources on their website. I highly encourage everybody to go and check out the report. They have specific qualitative findings that give quotes from almost every single state in the country. And this is the first informed piece of information about what's happening in schools. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. It's pretty clear that we need organizations like the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center um, to help us address and resist the Trump agenda but what we need more than anything else is each other. We need to organize, and what 
uh, the group of us, the very small group of us who organized this teach-in, which by the way was primarily students, so thank you very much. Uh, the small group of us who organized this teach-in and the, and the small group who organized the previous teach-in, which are actually mostly two different sets of people, have come together to call for a day of resistance on January 20th, 2017, which is Inauguration Day. From day one, we are going to demonstrate our collective power to not only resist the Trump agenda, but to overturn it. So please, if you're interested in organizing, and we need you to organize with us, um, attend a meeting here on campus in the Saunders Hall Courtyard next Monday, December the 12th at noon. Uh, there are sign-up sheets uh, being circulated asking for your names and emails. If you're interested in organizing, please put your name down so we can contact you. Our next speaker is a distinguished visitor that we are very, very fortunate to have here on campus. Um, brought by the Dai Ho Chun Committee, Professor Gopal Balakrishnan from the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So please join me in welcoming Professor Balakrishnan. Hi, um, I don't have any prepared comments, so I think I'm going to be brief uh, and say some things that I was. Can you hear me? Still can't hear me? Huh? Still can't hear me? Okay, there we go. Okay. I have to do it like this. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to underscore here, uh, in reinforcing some of the things that have already been said, is uh, what was the larger uh, dynamic which led to the breakthrough of Trump? Because we see something happening in this country which is really I think part of a disturbing pattern that's unfolding in uh, the wider uh, world in Western democracies, which is that in this period of economic crisis, uh, the main outlet for discontent against the political establishment and even against the, 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 the economic uh, elite has been unfortunately uh, opening up on the right, and we see uh, a very disturbing uh, rise of right-wing populism, both in this country as well as in Western Europe. Um, and so one of the things I think we have to really understand is, uh, why is it the case that right-wing populism has become, for white workers and for uh, the native populations of whites in Western Europe, a vehicle for expressing their dissatisfactions with the status quo. And I think one of the reasons why this is happening is because uh, progressives in many countries, including in this country, have not been forcefully demanding uh, challenges to the status quo in a way that would open up an outlet for those discontents on the left. And because there's no outlet for these discontents on the left, we see a little bit, of course, with Occupy, we saw a bit more of that with Bernie Sanders, these things have been shut down, a lot of that is gravitating towards the right. And so it's very imperative now to um, disestablish and to remove from the progressive uh, side of the political equation from the Democratic Party those forces which are really basically allies of the status quo, allies of the financial establishment, forces that have been promoting wars abroad and spying at home. Because we have basically been in the orbit of a Democratic Party which is aligned with capital in this country and war abroad, we have not found our progressive voice. And until we find our progressive voice, we are not going to be able to mobilize the key elements that are going to change this country in a progressive direction. That's Latino workers, that's white workers too, that's the black inner city, that's millennials who are being shut out of this economy. And I think it's really imperative that we look hard at what led to Trump's victory. We have a Democratic Party which has been moving rightward over this whole period from Clinton in the 90s and has forced the Republican Party or, or encouraged the Republican Party to move ever further rightward. 
They thought that they could win that way by discrediting right-wing candidates. They thought people would never vote for them. And they were right. Sometimes that strategy won, and now it blew up in their face. So we really have to look hard at the direction that has been uh, unfolding in American liberalism that led to this. We have a uh, American uh, liberal, uh, let's call it, uh, establishment, uh, which has been more or less okay with deportations as long as it happened under a democratic president. It's been more or less okay with spying and wars abroad as long as it's happening under a democratic president. And this is what is breeding Trumpism. This is what is breeding the dynamics that are driving this whole political system ever further rightward. And we are reaching a danger zone in which unless we reverse the direction, we're in trouble. So, um, although it's very important to focus on Trump now, that's the main uh, face of danger, I believe we also have to look at the larger context, both socioeconomically, why is the capitalist system faltering, why is the political system uh, rumbling in a certain sense with it, and what are the responses on the part of liberals that have not been adequate to reverse the direction, have in fact, in fact encouraged it. We, uh, we can't be okay with war and deportation uh, as long as we have a soothing voice on the top. <laughs> Two million people were deported under Obama. Trump, when he was asked how many people he was going to deport, came up with that number. He could have fall back on the number. Obama deported more people than have ever been deported in the history of this country. So this is a real challenge here. We need to kind of break from these politics or else we're going to see more of the same and worse. So I'm sorry to have to present such a negative picture, but I really think it's a wake-up call for us, really forcing us to kind of examine, uh, again, uh, how we got to this point.
uh, as the use of nuclear weapons, given both Russia and the United States still have not forsworn the use of battlefield nuclear weapons. Uh, the second major area of screw up uh, is in the US, Japan, and South Korea alliance, uh, something that has been pretty tormenting to people in both Japan and South Korea, and places like the island of Okinawa, uh, which could become worse under Trump, particularly uh, if Trump continues to pursue the kinds of things he's doing in Taiwan. Uh, if you want to take Taiwan seriously, imagine what would happen if China were to go to Puerto Rico and support, not statehood, but nationhood. Uh, in fact, that happened one time, and it was Russia, and the United States' response to it was, let's call it uh, the closest we've ever come to nuclear conflict. So these kinds of amateurish tactics uh, on already bad policies uh, could become very violent very quickly. Uh, bad things we are already doing that he will do worse. Uh, I think one of the greatest disappointments of the Obama administration is that there's been no effort to bring the drone program and particularly how decisions about the drone program are made back into something resembling rule of law, meaning there is no external review, there's no way to know how and why people get chosen. Uh, we find out very few facts even after the events have already taken place. Uh, there are two critical areas in which uh, I think Obama's failures will expand under Trump. The first is that, at least under the Obama administration, uh, there's been a decision not to de deploy what we call autonomous weapons, meaning weapons which can choose their own targets and kill their own targets without any humans being within the loop. That's not a technological barrier any longer. That's a political decision. And it's a political decision Trump can make without any oversight from Congress or any review from the courts. The second is the expansion of lethal armed drones into domestic politics. Uh, over 200 police departments have applied for licenses to use drones in civil conflicts, including things like protest and free speech. Uh, so far, those are basically monitoring drones or drones that can deploy so-called non-violent weapons, which often prove to be lethal. Uh, I think that will expand. Uh, the third category are things that he will do, uh, which I think are unprecedented. Uh, even if we want to be cynical about the degree to which the Obama administration tried to distinguish between a so-called war on terrorism and a war on Islam, any semblance of that distinction will evaporate under Flynn. Uh, Flynn will declare a war on all people of a Muslim faith uh, and say that it is the obligation of people who are Islamic to distinguish themselves from the enemy as opposed to the opposite. Uh, that's a new scale of enmity for which I don't think we've ever seen, probably since McCarthyism, but now armed with things like drone warfare and other kinds of extraordinary violent means. Uh, I should remind everybody that John Mattis was the leader who led probably the most despicable violent act during the Iraq War, uh, which was the total destruction of Fallujah, uh, with no respect to civilians, uh, leaving almost no one alive. Uh, so when Mattis becomes the new face of what U.S. foreign policy is supposed to look like, uh, look at what happened in Fallujah and get a sense of what that'll be. The last thing I want to say is to remind everyone that fascism is a jobs program, first and foremost. And that part of what Trump wants to do, and I think Bannon in particular, is to revive the U.S. economy through a renewal of the building of things like aircraft carriers and large weapon systems, which not only bait us for war, but also actually appease an extraordinarily discontent working class. Uh, we presume that our strategy is going to be premised on how Trump will fail. I think we have to start planning for how Trump can succeed, meaning I think he can give a lot of people a lot of jobs to build a lot of weapons. And he can, in the name of creative destruction, start a lot of wars to use up those weapons and build more. And we should consider what kinds of new constituencies a permanent war economy could create for the United States and how much harder it could be to build new coalitions. Uh, so when we think about geopolitics, think about what that kind of transformation looks like at home and abroad. And I think that's more than just worse. I think it's a, a kind of category change in what kinds of violence will be permissible. Thanks. is in part determined by what we accept. We need to make sure we don't accept this agenda. 
So please join us in organizing the Day of Resistance on Inauguration Day. We're asking people not to go to work. We're asking people not to go to school. We're asking people to not buy anything. We want to demonstrate our collective power to shut things down. So please join us in organizing the Day of Resistance on Inauguration Day, January the 20th. Come to a meeting here at UH Manoa in the Saunders Hall Courtyard at noon on Monday, December 12th. Um, I just want to ask in the audience if Thomas GM Baluka is here. <laughs> Fortunately for us, we have two speakers on climate change um, because it's that important. A scientist at NASA has anonymously written this letter in response to Trump's threat to shut down NASA's study of climate change. So this is a scientist, and I'm just going to quote the entire passage. Today, we were shocked to hear of Trump's plan to scrap NASA's climate change research as part of a crackdown on quote-unquote politicized science. Among the scientific community, climate change is no more politicized science than the theory of gravity. While his crackdown would mean that thousands of scientists and engineers at NASA, Goddard, would lose their livelihoods, it represents an even greater loss for the world. Without data continuity in our Earth observations, we will be blind to the ravages of climate change, to the deluges and the droughts that might devastate crops, to the extreme weather events that destroy communities as the Earth continues to warm. We will not be able to develop the solutions that can prevent Earth's temperatures from rising to catastrophic levels. I urge you, this anonymous scientist says, to implore your congressional, congressional representatives to not allow Trump's plan to happen. We cannot sit on the sidelines over the next four years. Our future on this planet is at stake. And there's no one on this campus that knows more about what is at stake in terms of climate change than Professor Maxine Burkett from the law school. So please join me in welcoming her. Exxon Mobil has not been uh, particularly helpful 
uh, at all for decades now on this question of, of how we uh, understand our climate and the impact of fossil fuel use on the environment. So there are a number of fronts. When we think about climate again, it's not just about the environment, it's about our understanding of how we engage with other countries, particularly countries in the global south, how we engage with our communities on the coastline. HUD has done some really uh, important work on this uh, with respect to relocation migration. And, uh, and then, of course, again, what we understand about our energy future is really critical. So paying attention to who gets uh, uh, nominated for that and what the work is that's done in the Department of Energy will be really critical. And when we're thinking about that, too, understanding that as we transition to a carbon-free economy, that the communities that are most impacted are also the poor communities uh, throughout the country. And just transitions are going to be critical in our understanding. Some of the lights are that we have such momentum, we have an international community that won't let us uh, 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 slip too far back. Um, and the fact that we are, at this point, looking at uh, fossil fuel projects that are being canceled left and right. And that's through, again, this, our people power. And what's happened in North Dakota is not to be dismissed as a fluke. I think this is the future of our conversation around the choices that we make and how all of our choices are related across areas of, of uh, a prior oppression, and again, with our use of, of, of power. Um, I, I will say as we're moving forward that what we, one of the struggles that we have had is trying to, again, have us understand that climate change is not just about the science of it, it's not just about the physical aspects of it, it's about its impacts on people. And the fact that disproportionately it's affected people of color, the global south, poor people across across the world, and certainly in our country as well. That conversation is going to be harder to have if we continue to think about climate change as something other. It's just a, an issue for an environmentalist, quote unquote. That conversation is not going to be about how we restructure our uh, political economy so that it works for everybody. And so it will be harder to have that conversation if, uh, again, if we're just thinking about it as, as climate change is an environmental issue. It's an issue about people. It's an issue about children. It's an issue of justice. It's an issue of human rights. And in the area that I, I, I work in very specifically, in, in the climate refugee area, we are seeing the fact that human rights are being violated in some extreme and phenomenal ways, and it's only set to get worse. Yet we're not having a conversation in that, in that way when we're thinking about rights in particular. We're having a conversation that really focuses on uh, security uh, or, or perhaps charity at its best incarnation. But these are rights. This is about correcting wrongs that have been perpetuated for for centuries uh, in, in many cases. And I would like us to understand that that conversation will be harder, but it's even more critical for us to get to a better endpoint. We have a, a hashtag that I've seen, not, not the new normal. Um, I, w I think there's a meaning there too when, it, when we talk about the impacts in our climate and the future that we're seeing. This is, uh, we, are, we are sort of coming upon a whole lot of uncertainties and unknowns. And if we can connect on, uh, in the ways that our communities find most um, important uh, and see how the climate is critical to that, I think we'll, we'll make better headway. So I, I invite you to uh, reach out to me and, and talk. We can talk about how best to move forward on these issues. I invite all of you to uh, join us. We're having a symposium actually next Tuesday and Wednesday on the issues of climate change and how it impacts uh, migration and displacement and relocation of communities. We have a number of tribal representatives from the continental U.S. coming, in addition to Alaska Native community members, uh, uh, Chief Albert Nakan from Louisiana, and Pacific Island uh, uh, representatives talking about their in, in, uh, experience of climate change thus far and how we're going to continue to struggle to keep uh, our, our lives uh, uh, secure. Thank you. Next time we'll get two speakers, promise. <laughs> if those of you over there are having trouble hearing, it's because the speaker unfortunately is only over here, so um, we can give you a few minutes to move on over if you'd like, if you're having trouble hearing. Thank you. So while they're moving, let me give you a definition of fascism. Professor Robert Paxton, Professor Emeritus at Columbia University 
and one of the world's foremost experts on fascist politics, defines fascism as follows, quote, Fascism may be defined as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood, and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraints goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. Sound familiar? We need to prepare for this. We need to prepare to defeat the Trump agenda. So again, please join us in organizing the Day of Resistance on Inauguration Day. If you haven't already signed up to help us organize, please do so. There's some clipboard circulating. To help us figure out the significance of democracy, we have Professor Joseph Tenke from the Philosophy Department here at UH Manoa. Thank you. On the, on the left, particularly in theoretical circles, democracy has become a discredited notion. And it's hard right now not to be cynical about the notion of democracy. We should not confuse or conflate electoral politics, the kind that brought us Donald Trump, with democracy. People organizing, people discussing, people affirming their equality with one another. That is the true meaning of democracy. I don't agree with the, with the, the common opinion that you're hearing voiced right now, perhaps by many friends, colleagues, fellow students, that say we ought to adopt a wait and see approach. Wait and see what President-elect Trump will really do. Personnel is policy. Personnel is policy. And we've heard speakers all morning talking about the kinds of appointments that President-elect Donald Trump plans to make. People who want to repeal Obamacare and perhaps deprive 30 million people of access to health care and health insurance. People who want to pursue an extremely hawkish, interventionist American foreign policy. People who intend to clamp down on any form of perceived political discontent at home by ramping up the police state and practices of incarceration. This is the agenda. It's up to us to resist it. It's up to us to resist it by coming together, by affirming what we have to lose and what we have to gain in doing so. Currently, President-elect Donald Trump is doing something rather unusual. He's taking a victory tour around the United States, whipping up people into a frenzy, getting them to chant things like build the wall and lock her up. He's amassing a tremendous following on Twitter, speaking directly to people, speaking directly to people's fears. Rather than, rather than entering into a conversation with people where there are the possibility of checking and correcting speaking back to the kinds of things he says. I think it's fair to, to, to recognize that um, a Twitter follower really is a follower and not just a voter. And this platform has given Donald Trump a tremendous opportunity to short circuit uh, the, the so-called mainstream media and therewith the democratic conversation 
that always goes on in this country. I understand Trumpism, Trumpism as a tremendous assault on democracy. Trumpism is the attempt to convert economic privilege into political power through the use of pseudo events and media spectacle. We lose every time we take the bait and begin to talk about the character and personality of Donald Trump and take our eyes off the agenda that's being put forward. Um, we need to be active in opposing um, the cabinet appointments that he, he's planning to make and instead of just talking about uh, the latest bait that he puts out there, uh, baiting us to, to get very upset about his attempt to uh, revoke First Amendment rights around flag burning. I think this is a distraction. This is part of the Trumpist strategy. And we must not be distracted. We have to be together, organized, prepared, and ready to confront this agenda. And I think the time to begin organizing is now. One of our greatest American philosophers, John Dewey, once wrote that the only cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. The only cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. And right now, Mr. Trump certainly looks like one of the ills that democracy has brought us. But this is democracy in action. This is the real democracy, which can help us rid ourselves of some of those ills. This means, I think, for me, that now more than ever, it's the time to reaffirm the institutions that our predecessors have worked hard to build. It's the time to protect things like academic freedom, like unions, including student unions, um, various workers' organizations, things that have been built up to protect people's freedoms, their rights to free expression, their rights to organize, and their rights to participate in the political process. I would like to see us inject into the national conversation a respect for truth, which seems to be lost in this post-truth election, and common sense. Let me just say um, a bit of good news by way of ending, that the philosophy department has agreed to support the Day of Resistance by hosting a workshop on the notion of democracy. We're going to be having a conversation. Thank you. We're going to be hosting a conversation primarily amongst ourselves, students, faculty, and staff on the notion and meaning of democracy, taking as our starting point a classic text by John Dewey called The, uh, the Search for the Great Community. And on Inauguration Day, any and all are, are welcome to come to the philosophy department and join that conversation. Thank you. The American Association of University Professors has called the election of Donald Trump as, quote, the greatest threat to academic freedom since the McCarthy period. And I don't think they say things like that lightly. Our next speaker is Professor Brent Edwards from the College of Education. So please join me in welcoming him. Let's see if I use my conference voice. Um, so I'm very pleased to be asked to speak here today um, about the implications of President-elect Donald Trump for education. Uh, earlier, one of the speakers talked about implications for education inside the classroom and how we approach teaching. I want to say a few things about the implications of Donald Trump for education policy more generally. Uh, and while there's a lot that could be said, I'm going to focus on uh, the implications of his pick for Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Uh, Betsy DeVos is from Michigan. Uh, she's the architect of the Detroit Charter School experiment, which has been going on for over 20 years. Um, I should also mention that along with his pick of Betsy DeVos for Secretary of Education, uh, Trump has mentioned 
as with his plans for the federal government more generally, that he wants to break the quote monopoly uh, that public schools have on education in the United States. Uh, this should concern us because uh, Betsy DeVos, in addition to being a proponent of charter schools, we should note that there is no evidence as a system-wide policy that charter schools are effective. Having said that, as I stand here in the state of Hawaii, it needs to be noted that charter schools in Hawaii look very different than charter schools on the mainland. And I think it's very important for us to be aware of that uh, because there are very different flavor on the, on the mainland. Charter schools started in the early 1990s, uh, particularly in Milwaukee and elsewhere, as an attempt to give parents and communities more choice with regard to the kinds of curriculum offerings that their children received. Since the late 1990s, however, there's been a, a strong corporate influence in the charter school movement. What that means is that it's less now, particularly on the mainland, and again, there are 34 charter schools in the state of Hawaii. Most of them are Hawaiian immersion charter schools. So what I'm saying in my critique of charter schools does not necessarily apply to the state of Hawaii, but it's important to be aware of these trends because they could have implications for Hawaii under Donald Trump because he is going to incentivize the adoption of additional school choice policies through federal grant programs, like those utilized under President Bush for other kinds of policies around standardized testing and teacher evaluation. Um, returning to my point about what charter schools look like on the mainland, uh, they are at the center of public school politics, particularly in urban uh, locations such as Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Detroit, uh, and on. We could, we could keep going with that list. If you look at all the studies of charter schools, and people on the left and people on the right have their pick of individual studies of which ones support the kinds of things that they want to say about charter schools. But if you look at the comprehensive reviews of what charter schools have meant, they have not found effects on the kinds of outcomes that charter proponents claim when they talk about the results of introducing competition into our public school system. First, it needs to be noted that charter schools do not induce competition. Public schools do not feel a sense of competition with charter schools. They do not, even in places like New Orleans, which has been entirely charterized, the entire school district is run by charter schools. What happens, instead of feeling a sense of competition to do better in terms of offering a quality education, what happens is that principals turn into marketers. Principals start marketing their schools in terms of the kinds of additional services that the students might receive. But there are no implications when you compare apples with apples in terms of test scores, for example. Charter schools are very good at forcing out on the mainland. Charter schools are very good at forcing out through unofficial means students who have uh, special needs, students who don't perform as well, students who come from challenging households, students who require additional attention and services. Those are not the students who will make the charter schools look good, so they counsel the students and their parents to leave the school for other schools. What that means is, on average, charter schools have parents with higher socioeconomic status. And as we know from the research, there is a very strong correlation between socioeconomic status and student achievement. We cannot attribute that to charter schools. It also needs to be said that there are many collateral effects of charter schools. One of the premises of charter schools is that, is that they can be shut down when they don't perform well. First off, that rarely ever happens, particularly in Detroit, where Betsy DeVos is from. Charter schools in the first percentile in terms of achievement, their charters are renewed. They are allowed to continue to operate. Second off, even if the logic of charter schools was carried to its um, end, that is, even if charter schools were shut down, we're talking about students here. We're talking about the disruption of the educational experience of students. Uh, there's, a, there's a fantastic episode by John Oliver on the problems with charter schools that came out about a month ago. It's 18 minutes long. It's fantastic. I use it in my classes. But the point here is that we cannot treat charter schools like pizza shops, and that's one of the analogies that charter school proponents use. If charter schools were shut down like people say they should be, 
What are the implications of that for students? What are the implications of that for families? If you're disrupting the educational experience, where are those students going to go? Particularly given how difficult it is to start a new school, to replace the one that you're shutting down. And in my previous job at a different university in Philadelphia, I was a charter school reviewer. I've seen what those applications look like. They're hundreds of pages long, but they're filled with boilerplate language that don't mean much of anything. And what they do is they play into the politics of school finance. Because at the same time that school districts across the United States are facing a context of austerity, where they have to make hard decisions about where funding dollars are going to go, you often see, you've seen this in a number of cases, where one year a number of public schools are put on the chopping block only for one or two years later that same school district to open a competition for new charter schools. And those charter schools often inhabit the exact same buildings where the public schools used to operate. What we're seeing here is a is a diversion of funding away from public school towards private interests. And while charter schools have to be for profit, there's nothing in law preventing them from being managed by a charter management organization that can itself claim a profit. What that means is charter schools receive so many dollars per student, and they hand over 95 cents on every dollar to the charter management organization, which then does claim a profit. And there have been countless examples of uh, corruption, uh, unethical behavior of people paying themselves, people who run the charter management organizations, paying themselves multiple salaries. Aside from the school level and what this means for the student experience, we also need to be cognizant of the fact that charter school networks are very influential politically. They were before and they are even more so now that Betsy DeVos is going to be the Secretary of Education. I mentioned that she was the architect of the school experience in Detroit. She's also the chairperson of an organization called Alliance for School Progress, I believe is the name. They are, at the, they are linked to the networks of organizations that are fighting for education policy reform across the United States uh, with charter schools and other voucher incentives or initiatives being among them. I think that's really important to remember because although Massachusetts recently defeated its uh, referendum on charter schools because there was a uh, vote recently where they were voting to whether or not to expand the number of charter schools that could be uh, operating in the state of Massachusetts, that was not the case in the state of Washington where uh, there has been some research on this, where you have the intersection of charter uh, proponents with wealthy philanthropies, such as Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and others, who are working in a coordinated and concerted effort across the states to introduce and to uh, win the approval of charter policies. We need to remember that because Hawaii is not exempt. Although charter schools look different here in Hawaii, Hawaii is not exempt from that kind of uh, policy networks and policy influence. Uh, Teach for America is a prime example. Teach for America does operate here in the state of Hawaii, has since 2006. And they are linked in with the Business Roundtable, who is linked in with the Hawaii Department of Education. Those same networks are linked in with these networks on the mainland, right? So I say that just to say that um, there's often a lag, what we see happening on the mainland. If it comes to Hawaii, there's frequently a lag of a few years. So my comments today, particularly with the relevance to the local context, is to say, this is what's happening, and we need to be aware that Hawaii is not immune, that this may be coming our way in the next few years. The last thing I want to say um, is that I'm relatively new to Hawaii. Uh, I'm looking for allies myself. I wonder where are, are all the progressive folks? Um, people who are interested in alternatives, not only alternative education policy, but alternative ways of organizing our, our political and economic system. So uh, I'm looking to connect with those kinds of folks uh, by being here today. So thank you. So we do win sometimes, and we win a lot. Standing Rock Sioux Tribe just won. Water. For now, we need to keep supporting them. I know this is an odd thing to celebrate, but the fascists did not get in in Austria. <laughs> pretty damn good. Especially when everyone was scared that they would be, and they were defeated. Obviously, they were, you know,
know, the party that is in place is not perfect, far from it, uh, but the fascists were kept out and that's no small victory. Continuing on with the victories is a small victory here at UH Manoa that Professor Gay Chan from Art and Art History is going to talk about. Hi everyone. It's just a short announcement. I'm very proud of my department, the Department of Art and Art History, that we are going to participate as a department on the Day of Resistance on Inauguration Day. And I would, and I'm here to call on all of you to get your department to join forces with us. Let's make this a day to remember. That's all. So two days after Trump's inauguration on January the 20th that we will resist, and one day after the Women's March on Washington on January the 21st, will be the 44th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which affirmed a woman's freedom to make her own choices about her body and her health. Roe v. Wade supports the broader principle that the government should not intrude on private decisions made between a woman and her doctor including protecting a woman's access to safe, affordable health care and her right to reproductive freedom from efforts to undermine or overturn them. Trump has publicly stated that he intends to appoint pro or anti-choice justices to the Supreme Court. In fact, Trump has gone farther than any previous Republican candidate or president-elect in stating outright that he wanted to appoint justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade. So we need to hear from the next speaker, who is Lori Field, the Hawaii Legislative Director and Public Affairs Manager of Planned Parenthood. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here today. I, it was a pleasure to be here to speak to you all about the programs and uh, strategies that we're going to be looking into over the next um, four years. Um, again, my name is Lori Field. I'm the Hawaii Legislative Director and Public Affairs Manager for Planned Parenthood Votes Northwest in Hawaii. We are the political and advocacy arm of, of Planned Parenthood here. And I don't know about you all, but the last month has been really rough, um, both personally and professionally. Uh, it's been uh, days where I just needed to pick myself up and dust myself off and interact with like-minded folks like you all to really inspire and turn the, uh, that despair and that fear and uncertainty into some energy and some action. And so again, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I hope that we can give you some opportunities to uh, participate in our efforts here in Hawaii and nationally, and uh, that you'll support our efforts in, in uh, whatever ways we're moving forward. Um, and as I said, it's a really uncertain time. And so we don't have any answers right now. We don't know what's gonna happen. But what we do know is we are facing an unprecedented, dangerous group of people who are looking to put us out of business and try to take away our access to health care, um, in particular our right to abortion. And so it's a really challenging and scary future ahead, but we will not lose hope and we will not go down without a fight. Planned Parenthood celebrated its 100 year anniversary across the country this year. We also celebrated 50 years in Hawaii. And we've seen some tough administrations throughout those hundred years, and we know that this one will face uh, some new challenges. We've been on the defense for a very long time, and this is a game we've played before. And we'll continue to fight for access to health care because we have no other choice. Across the world, Planned Parenthood provides sexual and reproductive health care services to over five million women, men, and children annually. These services include sexual education, outreach and advocacy, health care services such as abortion, birth control, STD testing and treatment, and cancer screenings. And these are all really life-saving services that we just cannot do without. Our national and regional leadership are geared up for, to put on the most aggressive defense strategy we've ever had to fight, including defending against defunding efforts, delaying implementation of any anti-choice legislation, litigating through the courts to protect our needs and mitigating where necessary to, lim to limit the impact uh, that these dangerous policies are going to have on our communities as well as our organization itself. Uh, while the future may look bleak and the road ahead will be long and difficult, uh, one thing is for certain, uh, our doors will stay open 
Planned Parenthood cares and we act no matter what. And we, don't, we won't go down without one hell of a fight. We've had 100 years of supporters, volunteers, and staff behind our movement and we are only getting stronger. We know that when Planned Parenthood is under attack, our supporters come out like never before. So in the state of Hawaii, we are fortunate to have a pro-women's health legislature. And this has meant that we are leaders when it, in, across the nation when it comes to passing pro-women's health legislation. Uh, for example, this last uh, legislative session, we were able to get a bill passed that requires insurance providers to cover 12 months of birth control at a time. Now, for those of you who are familiar with birth control and who have to go to the pharmacist one, two, three months um, to pick up your pills, you know that this is a, a barrier that a lot of women uh, just can't uh, get through when it, uh, because they have got so many things on their plate. So only having to go into the pharmacist once a year to pick up your birth control pills is a really big success for women and is in fact the most progressive women's health bill that was passed across the country last year. So we can be really proud of that. And with that, uh, we do have uh, opportunities for you to support our efforts in this upcoming legislative session. Uh, we have a student group here on campus called UH uh, Planned Parenthood Generation Action. This is a Planned Parenthood supported group um, led by students that uh, works to advocate for uh, better sexual and reproductive health uh, policies across campus and in our communities. And so what they did with us last semester, or well, your semester, our last session, was to work with us to advocate with our, uh, with our legislators, including lobbying visits, um, providing testimony and support, and attending hearings, and sharing their stories of what it means to have to go to the pharmacist every one to three months to pick up birth control pills when you're just trying to reduce unintended pregnancy. Uh, these are opportunities for um, for you all to get involved too. So we encourage you to join our Planned Parenthood Generation Action Group, sign up for our email list, and make sure that you get communications about opportunities to advocate um, here in our state as well as nationally. Uh, now more than ever, we need our supporters and we need our volunteers. We need people on the ground to make your voices heard. And so I encourage you to join our movement by joining us at the state legislature next session lobby our elected officials to um, increase access to sexual and reproductive health care services and funding. Uh, we need you to do things like write letters to the editor, um, write for your uh, college newspaper, um, call your representatives at the state and federal levels and let them know that these services are too important to be taken away. Um, in January, our Generation Action Team will be participating in a national fight back campaign. Uh, we're hosting training sessions to build up our volunteer leaders and increase our impact and participating in action forums we'll, uh, where we'll strategize our field work here in Hawaii. We'll be continuing to conduct outreach and share information and resources and really just want you to know that the voices of young people are so important and the voices of our patients um, are going to carry this movement forward. It's an opportunity to harness all these uh, feelings of despair and fear and anger and uh, really channel it into uh, activism. And so. Uh, Together we will fight back and together we will win. Thank you so much for your time. It's an honor to um, introduce our next speaker, Lalauni Teo. Aloha everybody. Close to the last person, I, I, yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, check me if I go too long because I don't have a clock. Mahalo <laughs> um, nui um, loa to everyone who worked to organize this and who've been working in the community, you know, to put on the rallies and all of the actions that have happened since all of these issues have come up and. This is a great time to be here today from my perspective. You know, there's so much that is threatening. And at the same time, the one really great thing that this abomination gives us is clarity. And that clarity is more valuable than gold. It's worth everything because clarity is what allows people to see enough that 
they can be moved to action and we saw that with some of the organizing that's already been done since the election and we've seen it we see it right here with everyone who's here who cares about the issues that are being affected by all of this so i want to say mahalo to everyone who's doing that work it's so important and a lot of it has been going on for a very long time and um you know i want to acknowledge all of that work that's been done i also want us to remember where we are <clears throat> All of these things do affect us, certainly. They affect people we love. They affect, you know, they affect our children. They affect people all around the world. They affect every single one of us. And yet, at the same time, let us not lose sight of the fact that really, this is Hawaii. This is not the United States of America. And that is very, very important to remember. If we forget that, then we will be lost because we, more than almost anyone, have the opportunity right now, right now, all of us, to rebuild that which was taken in 1893, which is a neutral country in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, dedicated to human rights for all people, dedicated to the protection of the environment and land and water and the harmony between people and Aina and between people and people. That is what our kingdom built until 1893, and that is what we can rebuild now, all of us. And in doing so, in doing so, we give the world a shot at survival. There is a real shot here for people to wake up, to stand up, and stand together, and to be able to really not just address this issue or that issue, but to address what we call pono. We can actually make things pono. And I think Standing Rock has give us, given us a very good picture of that, that it's very important what you see in the resistance isn't just, you know, and we also saw this in Mauna Kea and are still seeing this in Mauna Kea and many other things. There are situations heating up on Kauai. There are situations in Red Hill where fuel storage tanks are leaking into the groundwater. Um, you know, in all of these things, the restoration of Pono calls for the action of Pono. And that means a lot of what we got to see in social media in Standing Rock. You know, you see people sharing with each other. You see people enacting traditional culture. You see a lot of people um, <clears throat> sometimes awkwardly integrating with Native communities, you know, activists from all over the place, but still finding their place and able to contribute in a way that doesn't further colonization. Well, sometimes it does, but you know, when you have something, when you have the ability to correct that and the ability to work with it, then you have the ability to make it pono. And that is what we need right now. We need to build pono on every level in protecting education, in protecting women's rights, in protecting um, people of all genders and all orientations and everything. We need to protect every, everybody no matter, you know, we need to protect the people who are being hunted down by police and being shot in their cars by police because of the color of their skin. We need to protect those same people who are out here as refugees on the streets right now because they would die on the streets where they came from because it's too cold. 
you know, their human rights are important too. And by the way, we do a Food Not Bombs every Sunday, come down, play music. It's, um, it's, it's pretty cool, just bring whatever food you have to share. We share it with the houseless and anybody who shows up um, at down at Thomas Square. So, um, you know, and, and also bring a little bit of Hawaiian culture too into that understanding. So, um, I want to mahalo everyone and I really want to urge everyone, don't despair, don't be down. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for, in real terms, revolution. Don't be afraid of revolution. It's the time to move, to really change this from the beginning, from the bottom to the top. And we start here in Hawaii. So mahalo all of you for being here and mahalo to everybody who, um, who <clears throat> was, went into creating this. Um, okay, I'm gonna play a song. not exactly an um, ideal miking situation, so bear with me. This is not one of my songs. This is a song by my musical mentor for over 20, uh, 25 years now, um, Liko Martin, who is uh, right now writing to the United Nations as we speak. Um, many of, in, uh, one of his many, many efforts from the time of Kalama Valley, which really started our movement, our active movement as we know it here in Hawaii. And, um, you know, he's still, he's still out there doing that, that work as a kupuna now. So I'll play one of his songs. Um, this was translated by Kupuna Pilahi Paki, who really stood for peace. She was really, really a strong, strong voice for peace for all people and for aloha. And that is something that we can share as love, as currency, because that is our traditional currency, and as a force for revolutionary change. I should say that um, this, this song has been played in this spot a few times. I see Carolyn up there. We had this big old, during the Gulf War, um, in way back in, oh my gosh, 1991. We had um, a big encampment down here. We filled this whole place with structures. Yeah, Carolyn. <laughs> It was pretty cool. We were here for like a couple months, and it was um, it was a very it was a very awesome way to tell the university and the community that you know stuff needed to be real, and it did get that message across. And um, I remember playing this way back then, and at that time, my mentor. Uh, I, who I learned the song from. I didn't actually learn it from the author Liko. I learned it from Kuvai Puna Prajin, who was a very strong warrior back in the day and then died the next year fighting the H3 freeway. But um, uh, anyway, this is, this is a song I learned from Kuvai Puna um, that was written by Liko, who I play with now and who you folks can keep an eye out for because he's still going. Now we mako, mako honua, Ivalea malini no, Lohe mako, Inaleo ali, Naleo mokole lupana, Iki maka mako ikanani. Ha! 
under President Obama, the NLRB has made decisions that have made it easier to organize and improved collective bargaining rights. We expect that Donald Trump will reverse those, including a decision that allowed graduate assistants at public at private universities to form unions and engage in collective bargaining. Now this is something that's not just important for graduate assistants, it's important for everyone. I want to tell you just a little bit about what graduate assistants have done with the gains that they've made. Graduate assistants have federated into a coalition of graduate employee unions, and from that, they were the first members of the labor movement to take a stand with Black Lives Matter. They were the first members of the labor movement to stand with Standing Rock, not only calling on the AFL-CIO to take a similar stand, but also sending money and members down to stand with water, water protectors. Given Trump's policies, I don't think he's going to look the other way when it comes to grad assistance. So what can we do locally? Well, first of all, I'm not just here to educate you on what Trump is, on the terrible things Trump is going to do. I'm also here to recruit and try and organize you. So one of the things you can do locally is to support your union. We'll be back at the legislature trying to establish bargaining unit 15 for graduate assistance. And we could use all of your help. Here in Hawaii, we have the opportunity to put in place a firewall to protect us from the harmful policies that Donald Trump is going to take. We also have the opportunity to start building a better alternative to what we've seen on the mainland. To demonstrate that, uh, to demonstrate that there is a better way to solve the problems that people are experiencing. If the folks down at the state legislature and in the governor's office want to be a part of that, want to support workers' rights, want to support the uh, and care for the INA, want to support the university and the right for an education, then I think we can have their back. But if the folks down in the big square building are going to sell out the INA, if they're going to trample workers' rights, and they're going to take a hatchet to the university, then we're, if they're going to run around with Donald Trump, then we're going to run them out of office. While establishing and organizing our union is our priority concern, it's not our only concern. We look out for all of our members, not just in terms of their interest in their contract interests, but also in terms of the experiences and threats of violence that they face. When we see attempts to roll back the right to choose, when we see attempts to sell out the INA, when we see attempts to uh, to, uh, sorry, to defund higher education, we will be there to fight it. Because when you join a union, your interests become the union's interests. So I'm going to ask that you continue to support your labor unions, uh, not just the one that you're in, but also look for ways to cross the, to stand on the picket lines when others go out on strike and support the labor movement as a whole. Thank you. So tomorrow is December 7th, 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Two empires battling it out for who can control the workers and get up, scoop up all the wealth. After Pearl Harbor came the Japanese internment camps. A spokesman for the pro-Trump pro Great America PAC cited World War II Japanese internment camps as a precedent for Trump's discussed plan for a Muslim registry system. So we need to organize against that. Please join us next Monday, December 12th at noon at Saunders Hall Courtyard to start organizing for a day of resistance on Inauguration Day, which is January 20th. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Diana Berry. Aloha, everybody.
everybody. We awake, we here. Well, I just got out of class, so I'm very awake. And I'm really passionate about what I have to tell you guys. Um, if you guys went to the Teach and Act Up before, I talked about how important it is to be, you know, standing as one in solidarity. But today, what I want to talk to you guys about is action. Right now, it's great that we're all standing together. And we're all sitting together and unifying as one to recognize and acknowledge other people's problems. And to acknowledge that there are problems in our community that is going on that we need to work on. But after that acknowledgement, we have to do things. A lot of things on social media I've been talking about, like the safety pin. And you know, the safety pin is important. It's important at first. I need to know who doesn't think who does and who doesn't think my life matters. The LGBTQ plus community needs to know who they can talk to, who they can stand next to. But after that, we still need help. And I'm not just saying we, like just black people. Everybody still needs help. I don't want this that we're doing right now to become a social justice bystander effect, where we're all united right now, and then after that we're waiting for other people to do something. I want each of you guys, again, to know that you all have a job. There are some jobs I can't do that you can do. There are some jobs I don't even know exist right now that you can do that I can't. And I want you guys to understand that and take it to heart. Last night I got to see the most beautiful thing ever. I saw veterans kneeling down to Native American people, my people, and telling them that they're sorry. But while they're doing that, they're also protecting them against all of the stuff that is happening at Standing Rock. A lot of people are indeed standing with Standing Rock, but they're not there. They're not doing anything for Standing Rock. It just, if you think my life matters, I need you to do something about it. If you think your LGBTQ plus friends, if you think they matter and they don't deserve to be beaten up, I need you to do something about it. If you think illegal, illegal immigrants should be able to come to our country, and they, they don't make that much anyway. They're just trying to survive just like the rest of us. If you think they shouldn't be beaten up the way that they are right now, then you need to do something. Islamic women, they're getting their hijab snatched off. I'm going to Texas, so I know that I'm, I'm Lord. I need to know that the people who stand with me who wear safety pins aren't just wearing their safety pins so they feel better. I need to know when you have a safe zone button on, that you're not just wearing it, you know, for GP because it looks nice, because it's socially right to wear it. I need to know that you're going to help me if I need help. If somebody calls me the N-word on campus, you're going to check them. I don't have to check them. Who's <laughs> not here, who's not speaking. Teachers, faculty, your undergrad students are going to be hurting so bad. There is not a lot of undergrad funding. We have to take out $50,000 loans a semester sometimes. Acknowledge our pain. Help us out. I have, a, I have a professor, he helps me out a lot. And that means so much That means so much to me, to have one to three professors just care. That, that's, just care and do something. This is not just a teaching. This is a teaching and act up. So don't forget to act up after you leave the teaching. What's the plan? Okay, we already have 
Also, the vision, I can be short about that because we live in Hawaii Bay, the most beautiful place on the planet. And before Western contact, there was a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of years of experience of how human beings can live together in peace, respecting the land, malama aina, malama ikapai, so that no one goes hungry, everyone has meaningful work, there's lots of time for leisure, developing the high arts of surfing, hula, mele, the visual arts to the highest degree. Why did we have so much time for leisure in Hawaii? Because we took care of each other and we shared. It's a simple vision, but guess what? It's called sustainability. It's how we're going to save this planet Earth. There's a picture of it right behind you. Because we in Hawaii have been studying this for a long time. And we have that history of how people lived. Malka to Maka'i, taking care of each other and the land and giving them back so much richness. And you compare that to what we have in Hawaii today where the billionaires are getting condos put up in Kakao so we can't even see the ocean from the mountains and we can't even see the mountains from the ocean. We're selling those to billionaires who don't even live here. The realtors will tell you they'll buy three at a time and not even live there. They just need a place to park their money that they're making by exploiting people somewhere far away from here. All right, so we know how bad it is. We know how we have a president that's prepared to put the same billionaires that strip mined our economy now in charge of the economy, and we know that's wrong. So the next question is how we're gonna stop it. Um, and that's the last of what I wanna say today. How we're gonna stop it is real democracy. I teach at the law school and I study the Constitution. The first words of the Constitution of the United States are, we the people. There are three branches of government and they work for us, we the people. And we're going to have to remind them every step of the way. We're going to have to remind Congress to do their jobs. No confirmations of cabinet members, of judges who are opposed to the Constitution of the United States, who don't believe in equality, who don't believe in the basic rights and freedoms granted by our Bill of Rights. If they're not for that, they're not going to move past our bodies. And that's the next question. How do we put our bodies in front of this machine and make it stop? I support what's being called a general strike, a day of action on January 20th, because we can send a clear message contained in each of our bodies that we're not alone. There are millions of us across the country who are ready to say no business as usual. As a professor, I'm well aware that the end of democracy is signaled by the day they come to the university and start arresting faculty. That's what happens every time a general, a junta, a dictator, a fascist takes over. And it's happening now in some countries. It happened in the United States under McCarthyism. We know what this looks like, and we know that if we don't fight back now, that's where we're going. But Donald Trump is not my focus because he's the figurehead, he's the puppet that has put, been put in power, and this is happening all over the world. People like him, the strong men, are getting elected in places like the Philippines because people are genuinely, genuinely scared of how they're going to survive in a disrupted world. The collapse of capitalism all over the world is causing the deepest and ugliest hardship for people, many of whom have had to flee their homes with their kids and whatever they can carry in tow. They're looking for an answer. And we have to take that populist fear and anger and bring to it what we have at the university, which is knowledge, education, the ability to do consciousness raising, and build coalitions, it's hard work. Uh, but we know how to do it because we've been doing it. 
and we have teachers. We have teachers historically that were alluded to earlier, people that have led great struggles in Hawaii. The Protect Ka'olawe Ohana stood up to the U.S. military and won. Our last struggles in Waihole Waikane Valley, students from this university linked arms with workers and farmers and people who were living on the land, and they said no evictions, and they won. They saved an entire valley. The state of Hawaii was forced to pay $6 million to buy the land so that the farmers and people who were living off the land can continue to live there to this day. We did that by putting our bodies in front of the machines, literally in front of bulldozers, in front of sheriff's officers who came with guns to evict people. And we said, no, we have great teachers. We have the lesson of Standing Rock. You know, that was started by 15, 16 year old kids on the reservation who said, no, we have to do something. We have to save our water. We have to save our future. And they educated themselves quickly. They got their little YouTube videos and they started their encampments. And by the end, they had a million supporters all over the world and thousands ready to show up and put their body in front of the machine at Standing Rock. And they won. Are we ready to do that in Hawaii? We have to study their methods. It was coalition. It was nonviolent, peaceful, and militant at the same time. A lot of times, People think nonviolent civil disobedience means we make nice with the enemy. No, our job is to make their lives so uncomfortable that they give up. That takes courage, that takes discipline. Um, I want to insert here a footnote of a particular challenge we have in Hawaii in building coalition, and that is we have to confront the theft of the Hawaiian nation and all of our positions in that. I'm Sanse. I'm an Im immigrant. My ancestors were brought here from a place where they were being kicked off their own land as starving peasant farmers to work on sugar plantations here. And that was part of the system that stole Hawaiian sovereignty. But I want to go back deeper and ask where that plantation mentality came from and it came right out of slavery. What we're learning now is all our struggles are linked. The Southern planters were the architects of the ideology of white supremacy um, that supported slavery and that made capitalism in America. If you see some of the new research that's coming uh, out or read some of the old research, going back to Dr. Du Bois, this country's wealth was built on the genocide and removal of Native Americans and the institution of chattel slavery that made us the richest country in the world. And that came with political power. So our constitution, our laws, and the laws throughout the period of slavery were written by these um, sugar planters. And then, after the Civil War, they were able to regain power, and that was the end of Reconstruction, and continue to insert their policies into the governance of the United States. And guess what? That was the period of the overthrow of the Hawaiian government and the stealing of Hawaiian lands. Uh, all, all of this history of human displacement right here on this island is tied to the history of child slavery. And if you understand that, you understand that what we're up against is one machine that has always had um, as its basic tools imperialism, colonialism, racism, monopoly capitalism, denial of the human rights of ordinary people, denial of equality. Um, and now we have white supremacists in the White House. Um, I'm sorry. You've heard many speakers today saying this is unprecedented. We have not faced this level of threat in our lifetimes. So we can't treat it as a normal threat. We have to treat it as what it is. We have to be willing to figure out what the targets are in Hawaii. Because the people who are paying 
the people who want to take down democracy in America have their business interests here. They're hard to find because they're hedge funds. Their money is offshore and they hide their names and who they are. But their money is here and it's running things here. So we have to figure out what the specific targets are. We have economists and political scientists and very smart people because we're a university who will be able to figure that out. And then we find those targets, we go to them and we hurt them where it counts. We make it impossible for them to do business in Hawaii. We make it impossible for them to proceed um, with business as usual. And, and that's how we're going to reach the White House. That's how we're going to reach Congress. That's how we're going to make them do the right thing, even though they're all about taking and not giving us anything. It's going to be hard work. But we're going to learn from one another. We're going to have arguments that are, are hard, because we'll argue about tactics. We'll argue about um, what level of privacy to give the claims of made of Hawaiians for sovereignty. And I would argue that if Hawaiians aren't in front, nothing happens politically in Hawaii. Because our most vibrant political movements have been led by Hawaiians. Um, but I also want to say something about when we do that, when we, when we link arms and actually, I, I'm, are you willing to get arrested to save your life and save your planet? Because that's what we're asking. It's going to get serious. But I want to end on a happy note. It's also going to be a party, as it was. Well, as it was. Can you imagine what it felt like the day the Protect Kaha'olawe Ohana found out they had won against the American uh, military machine? Can you imagine what it feels like to be a 16-year-old who started organizing with a little YouTube video at Standing Rock and suddenly you won and, and all the, the reporters are coming to interview you and it's a big party and everybody's dancing? Okay, we're going to have the best playlist. <laughs> we're going to have the best food. How many of you are artists? We're going to have the best art, the best visuals. There's going to be love, there's going to be joy, there's going to be there's going to be sharing, there's going to be play. We will embody it. That's what our revolution is going to look like. We're going to show a different way of being in the world, a different way for human beings to interact with each other. And it's going to look so good that nobody's going to want to be in that room where small-minded people fantasize about they have, they have superior DNA. And that's why they're destined to be the masters of the universe. They are so miserable and so unhappy, and we are going to have so much more fun than them, that everybody's going to come over to our side. It reminds me of the day um, when we won marriage um, equality at the legislature in Hawaii. At the last round, the last round of struggle, on one side of Baratania Street was the anti-gay rights people. And they looked snarling, miserable, angry. One of them literally spit on one of my students. Um, and a guy said to me, you are going to burn forever in hell. Right. On the other side of the street, there were balloons, bubbles, people dressed up in fancy dresses. They were blasting Gloria Gaynor on a really good sound system that had come from Hula's. Um, and I walked up, and somebody gave me a big hug and told me I was beautiful. It was really clear to me which side is the future and which side we want to be on. Um, so I ask you to join the party. They're going to say, let's get back to a time when women couldn't control their own reproductive health. Let's get back to a time when white was right and other people had no civil rights. Let's get back to a time when there were no unions and workers had to do whatever the bosses said, whether it was safe or dangerous or legal. They'll say, let's get back. And we will say, let's fight back. Are you ready? When they say, get back, we'll say. When they say, get back, we'll say. When they say, get back, we'll say. Are you ready? January 20th. Say this.
This is a democracy, and love is going to win. Thank you very much. Thank you, and the party begins. So sign up, come to our meeting December 12th to organize Inauguration Day Resistance. Thank you all for coming. Sorry, I forgot. We have someone with a very, very important message about protecting water on a walk. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, right now we have the Standing Rock in Hawaii, of Hawaii. We have, right now, there are 12 million gallons being diverted for corporate greed and not for the people, not for the Aina. And we can do something about that. On Friday, Please join us. Show up at the board of uh, BLNR Board of Land and Natural Resources meeting, and we can show that the people are not going to accept the theft of millions and millions of gallons of water. Join us. If you want more information about this, pick up one of these flyers. We are YPDA. Join us. We are going to participate in many other actions in the future. Um, on, on another note, today. There is a one a House representative seat on Hilo, in Hilo that we get to fill. It get, we can put our invoices in that we want Moana Kealii to represent the state of Hawaii. Moana Kealii is a strong advocate for grad student unionization, the $15 minimum wage, and many other things that we stand for here in Hawaii. So we are planning to go down there today to participate and have our voices heard. If you have your phone, pull out your phone right now. Uh, we, I want you to call the governor and tell him to support Moana Kealii. -E. So if you have, have your phones out, everyone, I want you to write down or type in 586-0034. Five eight six zero zero three four, and we can call the governor and have her voices heard to put in Moana Kealii into elected office, so that we can have a better future for Hawaii. And please, please show up Friday for to protect the water. Our brothers and sisters on Maui cannot show up. They dick us over by putting it on a walk. They knew that what they were doing, but we're going to show them that that does not work. We are going to be there, and we are going to show up and persuade them and have the people's voices heard. Thank you. Woo!